Ever wonder how all the magic happened on I Dream of Genie? Or just what went on behind the scenes? All I do is think and blink. Well, there's gotta be more than that, Genie. So you wish it, so it shall be. I'm your host, Nostalgic Nick, here to take you right inside the Genie's bottle for some little known facts about our favorite magical sitcom. Well, one of our favorites, but we'll talk a little more about that heavyweight rivalry soon. If you enjoy this throwback, be sure to give it a thumbs up for us, and don't forget to subscribe so you never miss a trip down memory lane. But without further ado, let's hop right back into the bottle. Magical Inspiration Everyone wants to find a wish-granting genie someday, but is it enough to make an entire show out of? The inspiration behind I Dream of Genie can be attributed to the 1964 film, The Brass Bottle. In the film, an architect played by the odd Tony Randall buys an antique that just so happens to house a genie who wants nothing more than to thank his savior by doing favors, usually causing more harm than help. Sound familiar? Oh. Reviews of the film were not kind, but incredibly, Randall's fiance in the film is played by the soon-to-be genie, the lovely Barbara Eden. The show's title was inspired by the 1854 parlor song, Genie with the Light Brown Hair. Note, it is genie with one N, and the song doesn't explicitly say anything about a magical wish granter, but it does have the line, I dream of genie with the light brown hair. Here and gone. It only takes a few notes before you start humming that famous genie opening theme song. But for however catchy that happy jingle is, it actually wasn't part of the show until season two. For season one, the intro floated between songs, while the producers argued which one they liked best. While that theme song will live on forever, the set itself suffered a very definite conclusion, as it was all burned to the ground. As dramatic as that sounds, it was actually pretty common. It cost too much money to support something that quite possibly would never be used again. So, Scorched Earth made easy work of that. Although, don't look for any of its ashy remains in the Panhandle State. 1020 Palm Drive, Cocoa Beach was actually shot in Los Angeles. Even the window views from Healy's office. Cast Conflict To avoid being confused with the already popular Samantha Stevens of Bewitched, I Dream of Genie producers really wanted their magical star to be a brunette. Lucky for us, no one stood out as Genie in auditions, and they couldn't deny Barbara Eden was the best for the role. The studio brought her on and did the respectable thing, beg her to dye her hair, which she refused. They did sort of get their wish when Eden plays Genie's evil twin, complete with green outfit and brown hair. But Eden wasn't the only one facing an uphill battle. It's hard to believe, but master of slapstick and comedic timing Bill Daly had a hard time learning his lines. That's because he was actually dyslexic, and he did find a perfect way to get around that by just making brilliant stuff up. Shall we go over the scene once more? I don't think that'll be necessary. I know my lines. An old pro never forgets. Sadly, Larry Hagman had the worst battle of all. Behind the scenes, he battled serious anxiety, and his cure-all was alcohol. Hagman had big dreams, so playing a secondary character in a series was actually a nightmare for him. Eden revealed in her memoir that Hagman's day started with champagne, then a midday break to his trailer for pot and more champagne. Throw in some pills, and it's no surprise that he needed a liver transplant in the 1990s. Hagman was reported often very difficult to work with, voicing his criticism of the scripts, escalating to a near nervous breakdown where he was simultaneously crying, vomiting, and pooping. Hagman continued with, quote, even the wax from my ears was coming out. I was exploding. Luckily, therapy and experimental LSD was all vital in gaining control of his anxiety and his drinking problem. The genies out of the bottle. Genie's Magical Bottle was originally an old Jim Beam whiskey decanter. Pretty cool. It is most cozy. At first, it didn't have much color or ornamentation on it, since the show was in black and white. But once it went to color, they glammed it up. Barbara Eden actually owned the original Genie bottle for a number of years. At first, she displayed it in her office, as one does. 
But once someone pointed out how it was the only one in existence, she stored it in a bank vault. Eden has since calmed on the paranoia and actually donated it as a piece of TV history to the Smithsonian. As for the interior of the bottle itself, it was made up of purple-pink velvet upholstery, brocade, satin, and glass jewels. Jeannie makes it look as easy as one, two, three to get in, but it actually took a lot of work. It was built on a soundstage, only reachable with an eight-foot ladder. Mind the sensors. Jump back to the 60s, and a lot of things were no-goes for the precious eyes of the world. Not many people knew Barbara Eden was pregnant during most of season one, and the show couldn't have a magical, otherworldly genie with a baby bump. You're gonna have a baby shower. Not now, not now, Major Heaney. But even if she were human, they'd still have to hide that stomach. Even after the pregnancy, the show still had to be careful how they composed the shots, because her outfit often revealed her midriff. And that's all fine and dandy, but wait, what is that? Is that a belly button? Absolutely not! I can explain all this, sir. So that's why Jeannie's pants were always hiked up just enough to cover her navel. And don't expect to ever see any hint of how Tony and Jeannie would make a baby. They were barely allowed to be seen in their bedroom together at all. They never sit on the bed together. In fact, the show usually adhered to the restrictions by having Jeannie leave as soon as possible. Oh, the 60s. Jeannie vs. Bewitched. Okay, let's talk about the beautiful elephant in the room. Samantha vs. Genie, which vs. well, Genie. And we do have an entire video comparing these stellar show-stealing beauties, so we'll just touch on it here, as it was a very serious rivalry. Genie had the misfortune of being released a year after, and the Bewitched team used this to often accuse the Genie showrunners of stealing ideas, plots, and even characters. But there was cause for concern. TV writer James S. Henderson was double dipping, writing for both rival shows on rival networks at the same time. When the news broke, the Genie staff fired him immediately. I mean, there were plenty of similarities fans could point out. But one I always thought was funny was how both leading ladies had evil counterparts in a different color palette. And both times, the actresses just played the evil twin or cousin herself. Then, of course, there's the infamous Genie episode with a very special guest star, a chimpanzee whose name was... Sam! Where? You found Sam! Yep, Sam, short for Samantha. Now that's an act of war. Making the magic happen. Let's begin with the signature Genie entrance or exit smoke. Our special effects weren't very sophisticated. We did a lot against blue. When the show was in black and white, they used dry ice and a fan to direct the plumes where they wanted. Working without color made things easy for the team, and that's why I Dream of Genie would be the last show broadcast in black and white. But the team figured out a new trick for Genie Smoke too. They started using colored lights to tint the dry ice smoke. As for the scenes when laundry folds itself, those shots were secured by attaching the clothes to puppet wire while an experienced handler moved around a catwalk above the set. The honeymoon's over. One of the most divisive decisions in TV history. I love you. And I want you to be my wife. The marriage between Jeannie and Tony. The cast and fans both like their relationship, how it was. Leave it to network execs to intervene. I'd like to introduce you to my fiance. NBC launched a huge publicity stunt by hosting a fake wedding for Eden and Hagman, scheduled for one week before an actual wedding episode aired. TV writers from all over the industry attended as guests at what was supposed to be a packed event. Instead, it ended as one of the most hated plot points of any show in the 60s. One of the wedding's biggest opponents was Barbara Eden herself, who sensed that much of the show's attraction was the romantic tension between Tony and Jeannie. The show even broke its own lore by having a photographer take pictures of a genie who's supposed to be impossible to photograph. And right on cue, after the wedding bells stilled, the show was cancelled. Magical meetings. A genie and a king walk into a bar. Oh wait, this isn't a joke. It actually happened. 
As Barbara Eden and Elvis Presley were both climbing the rungs of their own careers, they found themselves co-stars in 1960s Flaming Star. Eden first saw Elvis on The Ed Sullivan Show and knew right away he was something special. Flaming Star was one of Elvis's first projects after returning stateside from the army. She was impressed by his ability to express what she called emotional truth. He was fully transparent and the two bonded and became friends, even confidants. They both wrestled with body image issues and she gave him advice about this girl that Elvis had eyes on. That would be Priscilla. They were the picture of true love. Elvis was the happiest I'd seen him in a long, long time. For more on this and the many star-studded relationships of Elvis Presley, we have a great deep dive for you next. And the partnership of Eden and Hagman would only briefly part ways before meeting again in Dallas. There, Hagman was the cunning, hateful J.R. Ewing. Hagman actually missed the I Dream of Jeannie reunion movie, busy with this despicable oil baron J.R. But Eden was free long enough to have a brief arc with his character as Leanne de la Vega and just for the fans, Ewing tells De La Vega, you look familiar. I think it's good though that JR never had a genie. I Dream of Genie also owes a lot to NASA, as Tony is an astronaut. So the cast actually went down to Florida, and Eden helped launch a weather rocket while totally in costume. Then for dinner, they got to meet Buzz Aldrin, right before the Apollo 11 mission to the moon. Eden even gave him a kiss on the cheek. Nothing like a little genie magic for a little good luck. Fit as a fiddle. Today, Barbara Eden is 89 years old, but really it could be the 60s, because not much has changed. She's still the beautiful genie we fell in love with, and she has the clothes to match. To this day, Eden can still fit into her original genie costume, while I struggle to fit into my swim trunks from last summer. Barbara maintains her figure through a combination of weights, sit-ups, and cycling. She used to do spin classes, but a knee replacement surgery has put a damper on that. While Eden can fit into her costume, there's just not many of those left. Firstly, Jeannie wore very sharp heels, and those heels caught the excess pant fabric quite frequently. They would tear through it like tissue paper. I was always ripping the trousers with my heels. And if the costumes weren't shredded, they were all shriveled. All that magic smoke made the pants shrink right up to her knee. So you can add that to all the things the camera couldn't show. And that final fun fact has set me free. There's a whole wide world of nostalgic shows outside my bottle. So I want to know another one of your favorite sitcoms that we should dive into next. Let us know in the comments. And while you're there, let us know any genie trivia that we may have missed. If you enjoyed this magical reunion as much as I did, please give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel so we can grant all your wishes for more episodes. As always from all of us here at Do You Remember, thanks for watching, Master. Master.